águas profundas. Vamos embarcar numa longa jornada pela cultura dos oceanos. O Fronteiras do Pensamento apresenta a segunda parte da conferência Mares Sustentáveis, a Visão e a Realidade, com a oceanóloga e ambientalista Silvia Ur. No programa de hoje, vamos visitar as profundezas dos mares e do pensamento. Exploradora oceânica residente do National Geographic, a Dama das Profundezas apresenta as fascinantes curiosidades deste mundo azul. Oceanos, como se conectam com a vida e a cultura? E como podemos contribuir para uma relação sustentável entre humanos e o mar? Com vocês, Silvia Ur. Now, it's so fortunate for those coming along that you can in a short period of time learn what it takes to safely enjoy the blue part of the planet using scuba, flippers, mask, rebreathers, a new form of exploring the ocean, living underwater. I've had a chance to do this on nine different occasions. The first time, 41 years ago, in a, a little underwater laboratory, like an underwater hotel, where you're able to stay warm and dry inside I've had the chance now to use about 30 variations on the theme of submarines. This is the most recent one I've had a chance to use. It's one of the two Mir subs that have been operating under the aegis of, of Russia since 1987 is when they were first launched. They can go to 6,000 meters beneath the surface of the ocean. Presently, there are only a handful of submarines that can go that deep and see things such as this. The deep sea corals, the shrimp that live in association with hydrothermal vents, or these beautiful tube worms of the sort that live off the coast of the Galapagos, or glass sponges that occur in the deep sea. You won't find these things scuba diving. You won't see an octopus like this scuba diving. They're only found in the deep sea. But you can see things like this, coral reefs. There's some right off your, co your coast, off Obreos, one of the most celebrated coral reef systems in the world. Still little explored, but enough is known to know that they're really special and really do warrant maximum protection. Last year marked the 10th anniversary of the census of marine life. And over that decade, some 250,000 variations on the theme of life in the sea were cataloged. But what was the, the biggest discovery of all? They found a lot of new species. They connected a lot of dots about how systems work over their 10-year period of, of investigations. But it was the magnitude of what we don't know that really impressed them the most. How many creatures live in the sea? How many live in rainforests? We really don't know. By an order of magnitude, we don't know. Maybe two or three orders of magnitude, especially when you think very small about the microbes that we're just beginning to appreciate, how many, how diverse they are, how important they are. We thought a few years ago that there may only be about 300 different kinds of octopuses and squids. We know how to kill them. We know how to use them for bait or turn them into delicious, delectable things to dine upon, but we don't have names for most of them. This is a time when we must look at these creatures with new respect and think of something better to do with them than simply roast them or toast them or boil them or slice them or otherwise consume them, to realize that our lives depend on maintaining the integrity of the systems that are responsible for keeping us alive. It's only begun to penetrate our, our minds that air isn't just a given. 20% oxygen, 80% almost nitrogen, a little bit of carbon dioxide, just enough to drive photosynthesis, to keep the motor running so that the forests here in Brazil and in Africa, North America, all over the world, and the miniature forests 
of microbial life in the sea, the plankton, the coccolithophorids, the foraminifera, the, the prochlorococcus that delivers one in every five breaths you take, but was only discovered about 25 years ago. These small bits of plankton, phytoplankton, that do the heavy lifting of grabbing carbon and generating oxygen, replenishing it every day, every minute, every second of every day, somewhere in the world. This makes us vulnerable. If we trash the living systems that keep us alive, what does that mean for our future? Well, it's not an if. We are undermining the integrity of the systems that keep us alive. This is just a glimpse, a tiny glimpse, of what you see out in the ocean. It's not just water, of course you know that, but not everybody knows that. Now, you know that every person in this room is different from every other one, and that every person on the planet, really, every person who's ever lived or ever will live, every one of us is unique. What hadn't occurred to me until I started spending a lot of time underwater is that, well, yeah, it's true with fish, too. You, they have faces. Well, starfish don't have faces, but everyone is unique. The DNA in every creature on the planet is distinctive. And the other great miracle is how the chemistry of life holds us all together. So what we do to the rest of life, in a way, influences us. If you've ever had a cat, or two cats, or 10 cats in your lifetime, you know there are no two exactly alike, even though there may be a thousand or 10,000 or 100,000 orange tabbies, they don't behave the same way. They're all different. True with fish. No two parrotfish of this kind with the same arrangement of freckles on their nose or spotted rays, or little cowfish, trunkfish, angelfish, mores, you know, whatever they are, they're all special, each in their own way, and each one has a place in the greater scheme of things. Because now we have weather reports, we have satellites, we have the maps, we have the ability to go far at sea and come back safely home, even, if, even in a fog we can find our way home with the new technologies. We've done great transformations of the land, and it has served us well. We now feed seven billion people, largely because of the conversion of wild lands, wild systems, to our personal purposes, to feed our numbers growing. When I arrived on Earth, there were about two billion people. I've watched our population triple, more than triple, now seven billion. Earth doesn't get any bigger. Our ability to extract from the wild systems has greatly increased, however. Now we can trawl in the deep sea, get to places that previously we couldn't, we didn't even know where to look. Orange Ruffy, these creatures that can be as much as we think 200 years old, that we will decide, will there or will there not be dolphins going forward? Will there, will there not be tunas going forward? That's why living right now is so enormously important. We didn't know that we had the power 50 years ago to alter the nature of nature, but now we know. Now we know that we can alter the nature of the whole world through burning fossil fuels. Fossil fuels have been such a gift to us, powering us to a new level of understanding in the ocean, it's the oil and gas companies that have given the, the, the support for the technologies that now enable scientists to go where the otherwise would still be scratching for funds to try to develop systems to explore and understand the world from the inside out. Coral reefs, already there are signs that the acidification of the ocean may be part of the problem that is causing the decline of coral reefs around the world. The warming temperature, absolutely a factor. And coral bleaching that was first noticed in 1980, not that long ago. 
Now, there's news, bad news, all over the world about coral bleaching. It, there are some years that are worse than others. 1998, particularly bad year. Last year, a particularly bad year for the corals. Presently, only about half the corals in the world, coral reefs, are in pretty good shape. The rest are either gone or they're in a state of decline. Just last year, you weren't, it wasn't your backyard, but certainly the news ricocheted around the world about what happened in my backyard, the Gulf of Mexico, when the oil blowout took place and just wouldn't stop for months. It was riveting for all of us and it riveted people around the world because the question is asked, how are we going to cope with our increasing demand for, for oil, for gas, for coal? And what is, we think of it as cheap energy, but what is the real cost of this so-called cheap energy? What are we putting, what are we not putting on the balance sheet? And of course, that's not all that is causing problems. What we're putting into the ocean, not just what we're taking out of the ocean, is causing serious problems for wildlife in the sea. The nets, the discarded ones, and the active ones are accumulating at a rate that is really frightening. Now, I come from the pre-plasticozoic. I know the world before plastic. I tell people sometimes I come from a different planet because the planet that I was born on, in, at, whenever, it was so different that I can barely relate it to the planet that exists today. It isn't just the numbers of people, three times plus, doing to the natural world. We're finally getting to the if we are to have a future of realizing we have to take care of the natural world that takes care of us. We can no longer afford to use it as, as a dump site. These things, among, other, among other, other factors, this is valuable material that is too important to throw away. And in the process of throwing it away, we're causing more problems. We have treated the natural world as if there is no end to what we can take from it or what we can put into it that we don't want near us, but now we know. And this is a good news picture, even though it looks like bad news, it's good news. Old fishing nets in Hawaii that kids in their summer months go and volunteer to go diving and to retrieve all this junk that we've thrown into the sea and take it to a place where it can be turned into something more positive, like polar fleece jackets <laughs> and other things that may be of some use and a new life for these destructive things. Good news, I went to Hong Kong in July of this year. Although this is one of the great centers of consuming shark fins and shark fin soup, the kids are beginning to respond to the knowledge that there are limits to what we can do. A thousand school kids got together and signed their pledge to care for sharks, to do as Yao Ming, that great tall basketball player in China, is t asking them to do and, and saying that it's what he will do. And Jackie Chan, the other great Chinese hero, I will never eat shark fin soup again. It's a trend now that we know. This is a good news picture too. It's a sign that people do care once they know. And that's the key, it's knowing. This is good news for me. They're two of my four grandsons. I am motivated because I can see through their eyes and I tell people, if, if you really want to understand, get a child. If you do not have a child, go borrow one <laughs> and take them to some place wild, preferably some place wet and look at the world through their eyes, look at their future. Children are natural explorers. They're natural scientists. They do what scientists and explorers do. They ask questions. Who, what, why, where, when, how? And the sense of wonder, everything is new. Everything is fun. 
why do people sometimes lose that? Don't ever lose it if you have. If you have, go find it again. Go take a walk somewhere and turn over rocks and look at birds and just imagine that you're seeing it for the first time the way they are. This is the moment when we can choose a direction. Which way will it be? That's why this time is the most important time. We can choose. We don't have to just keep on business as usual, doing what has been done during all times past. Consuming, consuming, taking from nature. Now we can give back. We can begin to seriously embrace the natural systems on a level, on a scale, that will give us cause for hope. Some say for the ocean we need 20% by 2020. It has a nice sound to it, and it would certainly help to go from less than 1% to 20% in 10 years. I don't know whether that's enough, but it's a good start. On the land, we have about 12%. Maybe we should have 20% of all of the natural systems, at least, in the bank, as a security blanket, if you will, to keep the options open for the future. I want to share with you two more last little video clips that I think of as additional reasons for hope. So this is just a little clip, but it will give you the essence of what's going on right now. journey for us. You know, it's a huge statement and a huge honour to our forefathers. thousands and thousands of years later still doing at least a fraction of what they ever achieved.
So if you look closely, you probably caught a glimpse of solar panels <laughs> on those traditional canoes. The hulls were fiberglass, the sails new materials, embracing new technologies, but connecting with ancient traditions. The Cook Islands, I met with the Prime Minister of the Cook Islands in July of this year. Actually, I met when the Vacas came to San Francisco. I also met them when they went to Hawaii. I will see them in the next couple of weeks down in San Diego, and I intend to track them as they go to the Galapagos and then back across the ocean again. The Prime Minister has committed his country to by this June, establishing a million square kilometers of their exclusive economic zone for protection. I mean, like, yes. <laughs> really an important move. It'll move the needle toward that 20% by 2020. He is also committed by 2020 to be off fossil fuels, to embrace sail and solar so that his island nation can actually rely on the same elements that powered their civilization up until about the middle of the 20th century. Now, they are increasingly drawing on the fossil fuels for their energy source, but they can see how they can use sail again, these new sails, new materials, to use for transportation of goods, to transportation of people. Now, they may still fly planes in and out, so they're not entirely off of fossil fuels, not their intent, but the direction seems like a really positive one. And here's the thing, from a totally different direction comes a sporting event. It's one of the oldest sporting events in, in recent times, and that is America's Cup, the sailing event. This this phase, the next two years, culminating in the big race that will take place in San Francisco about this time of the year, September 2013, you're dedicating it to ocean care. Imagine a big sporting event saying, we want to use our power, our voice, our ability to attract attention and raise awareness for the ocean. So. More than that, wait till you see this little video clip. Talk about sail. I had a chance to go on board one of these hot catamarans, also in San Francisco Bay, also in July of this year. And I kept looking for the engine. <laughs> these are sailboats, no engine. Catamarans, sails, new materials, streamlined down to the last fraction of a millimeter by computer-generated engineering. They can capture the wind and magnify it so that they speed along three times the speed of the wind. Seems contraintuitive. How can this be? But the explanation is, and engineers will tell you, it's more a wing than a sail. They actually capture the force of the wind and magnify it. So, let's go on a little trip. Here it is, coming up. Wait. When they say flying on water, they mean it.
So there we are, sail. Now freighters are using sail assist, kite assist, to get greater efficiency as they power their way across the oceans of the world. And with the new technologies, plenty of reason for hope. Number one, this is the most important time of history to be around. Number two, the ocean, the natural world generally, is in trouble, and therefore, so are we. But the third thing, maybe the most important thing, is plenty of reason for hope. I personally am a hopeaholic for good reasons. You can see now that we know, and that's the key, and that's why this conference, what you're doing, is the key. It's all about knowing. It's all about caring. It's all about acting once we now know. Thank you. Você acompanhou a segunda parte da conferência Mares Sustentáveis, a Visão e a Realidade com a cianóloga e ambientalista Silvia Earn. Obrigado pela sua companhia e até o próximo Fronteiras do Pensamento.